Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis continuing from chapter five Road Trip. The next day Jeff and I were packing to drive to London to stay with Jeff's sister Finula Jeffries. Cornelius and Finula's parents thought that it would be cool and different to give their children unusual names. Cornelius and Finula had their own opinions on that. Finula or Nula as she was known to her friends lived in the area of London called Shoreditch. I always liked going there as there were lots of fun to be had and interesting things to see. I wanted to get to London by taking the train. I like going on the train, but Jeff explained how much more that that would cost us. Besides, he said, in the car we can shop and get out for a wee and we can travel from door to door. I went out for a sniff and a wee in the back garden before we left and to see Gizmo, who was out sitting on the garden wall enjoying the sunshine. Hey, Ned dude, called Gizmo. Hello, Gizmo, I replied cheerfully. We're going up to London this morning but we can keep in contact with video calls through my person's smartphone and your laptop. Yeah, great idea. We need to keep in contact in case anyone, anything else happens in this weird chocolate mystery. What you told me about that dog Rufus and his gang was super strange. I'm going to check out this crazy Gabba dude on the net. Yes, please, Gizmo. Let me know what you find out. Yo, Neddy, check out the far corner of your garden by the shed. It looks like there's a pair of Jeff's underpants that have been blown off the washing line. I bounded over to investigate. There was indeed a pair of underpants. But they weren't Jeff's. They didn't smell like his. They were orange, rather shredded and tatty. I gave them a poke with my nose. Gizmo, look, I called. There is something written on them. Do you think it might be a message? Gizmo acrobatically climbed around the garden walls to be above me. She leant down to have a look. Hey, it might be a message thrown over your wall. I don't think I noticed it earlier. Dude, read it out. I circled around the underpants until the writing was the right way up. It's written in pen, I remarked. Terrible handwriting. Maybe a dog wrote it. Uh, let me see. Wow, it says, danger of death. Keep away. Wowzers, dude, exclaimed Gizmo. Those are some scary underpants. Do you think it's meant for you or is it just a warning about the state of the underpants? I'm not sure, Gizmo, but I'm very glad we're going away for a few days. I want to leave all this strange stuff behind me. I don't like it one bit. Sure thing, dude, said Gizmo. You two need to go away and relax. I'll try. See you soon, I called. I'm going to pretend I never saw them. I had one quick last wee before we left and bounded back into the house. Jeff was just lugging his suitcase down the stairs. I told him about the message, but he wasn't very concerned. It'll just be children mucking about, he said. You ready, Ned? Then let's go. The journey from Plymouth to London took us about five hours, with only one wee stop. The traffic only started to get heavy as we approached the busy capital city. My person parked the car and unclipped my dog's seatbelt. I jumped down onto the pavement and had a good scratch, first one side and then the other. Wearing my dog seatbelt always felt a bit itchy. We were on a street of terraced houses with their front doors opening onto the pavement. There was a great smell here that I really needed to check out. A yellow door opened and out stepped Jeff's sister, Fanula, to help us with our bags and welcome us in. She had been cooking and rubbed her hands down the front of her white apron. Hi, you guys, she called. Did you have a good journey, Ned? She gave Jeff a big hug and bent over to fondly rub my ears, pulling her dangling ponytail to one side. Yes, thank you, I answered. The traffic was good and it didn't take too long. I'm dying for a wee though. May I use your back garden, please? Sure, help yourself. The back door is open. Thanks, I replied and made my way through the house, through to the kitchen and out to the backyard. Nula didn't really have a back garden like we did at home in Plymouth. It was more of a yard with raised flower beds all around the outside. It was surrounded by a high stone wall. There were no dog smells in the yard, but there were the odd smells of passing cats who had been crossing from one yard to the next. I weed against one of the flower beds, but as I finished, I had a funny feeling that someone was watching me. I raised my head to quickly glance around at the tops of the walls. I froze. Was that a finger that was just over the top of the stonework? Looking again carefully, I could see it was only a twig. Whew, it must be in my imagination. You're seeing dangers where there are none, I told myself. Those underpants had rattled me, though. It might be more than just kids. We're quite safe in Newless House, I said out loud. Weren't we? Chapter 6. On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Now that we are all unpacked, I'm just going to take Ned out for a quick run around in the little park you can have at the end of your street, Jeff said to his sister. He turned to me and said, I expect you'd like to stretch your legs, Ned. Yes, please, I replied, glad that he asked. And I can check out some new smells too. OK, boys, Nula agreed. I'll sort out a bite to eat for when you come back. We went out onto the pavement again, carefully closing the yellow wooden door behind us. After Jeff had checked there was no traffic, I scampered across to the small park that sat like an island in the middle of a square of other terraced houses. The park, known as Jesus Green, was surrounded by black metal railings, and we entered through a squeaky gate. As soon as I was on the grass, I felt a spurt of energy, and I ran across to the other side as fast as I could. 
I had a quick smell of the railings and sprinted back again. Wow, that's better, I said to Jeff. I needed that. I bet you did, Jeff replied. I'm just going to sit down at this wooden bench in the middle. Come over and join me when you've had a run around. All righty, I called as I made my way along the railings at the side. There was exciting spells here of all sorts of different dogs, cats and humans. I weed on everything I could. This was going to be a really interesting park, although I hadn't expected it to be quite as interesting as it turned out to be. When I had finished and made my way back to my person, I saw that there was someone else also sitting on the bench. It was obviously a man with shiny black shoes and black trousers. I couldn't see his body or face because of a large newspaper that he was holding up in front of him. His black gloved hands were holding the newspaper and the top of the smart black Homburg style hat was sticking up out of the top. I jumped up next to Jeff, in between him and the man with the newspaper. I shook myself, letting fly the usual cloud of white hairs. Jeff pressed his lips tightly together in a sort of smile as he saw that many of the hairs had landed on the trouser leg of the man with the newspaper. Suddenly, I jumped as the stranger spoke from behind the newspaper. Don't look at me as I speak to you. Look at each other. As if you're having a conversation, we are being watched, the man behind the newspaper said. In a slightly whispered but clear and careful voice, he sounded posh and very efficient. All the time he spoke whilst he was hidden by the newspaper, so we didn't see who he was. I turned to face Jeff as instructed. The man continued, I know who your chaps are. I know all about you. I know that you're called Ned and Cornelius. You have been travelled here from Plymouth today. We are from the Secret Intelligence Service, MI5, to you, and we know everything. Ooh, I said, but facing towards Jeff as the man had asked, We, you say? Who else is there? He did not reply. There was an uncomfortable moment of silence. Well, I continued, pleased to meet you. Yes, said the man behind the newspaper. Likewise, as I said, we know everything and we know that you know something we have known about for a while, that we know that you can tell us about. Um, said Jeff slowly, sounding a little confused. But I thought you said that you know everything. We do, the man behind the newspaper replied. We want to know how much you know. For instance, what is the name of the dog that you took to the vets? The one who ate all the chocolate with the wrappers still on. Who told him to do it? We want to know who delivered the underpants message and who controls the dog gangs. And lastly, who is Gabba? His newspaper shook as he spoke, as if to emphasise the importance of what he said. Don't look at me, he hissed. We are being watched. How do you know all this? I asked. I had turned to face him as he was speaking and turned quickly back again. That information is given on a need to know basis only. We need answers quickly. And you have been able to get closer to a gang member than anyone. You're a dog, so they trust you. You, we need you chaps to find out more for us. Uh, okay, I said, but how? Just carry on doing what you're doing. Yes, as you were, but stay alert and be careful. There will be dangers for both of you. Now look here. When I stand up, I will have a parcel for you on the bench. Pick it up and don't open it until you are inside. It contains all of the things you will need to follow the trail and find out more. Good luck. You're working for your country now. The royal corgis and their person. The queen expect every animal to do its duty. With that, he stood up, still holding the newspaper in front of him. He made his way out of the park, through one of the gates, and into a black London taxi that had been caught, pulled up. It drove off straight away. My person and I just looked at each other in sheer amazement, and then both turned to look at the brown paper package that the man had left in the park bench. Jeff's hand shot out, and he picked it up, hiding it under his coat. We turned our heads to look carefully around the outside of the park to see who was watching us. We saw no one, although it's possible we were being watched from the windows of any of the terraced houses. Making our way back, both of us were eager to find out what had been left for us inside the package. Jeff knocked on the yellow door of Nuala's house. She opened it with a broad smile. Hello, you two. You're just in time. Come in. I've set the table. Just sit down and I'll bring some of my homemade soup. The smell was delicious, and I almost forgot all about the package. One of the chairs was pulled out already, and I jumped up onto it. Je Jeff sat down opposite to me. He had taken his coat off, but he still held on onto the brown package. He put it down on an empty space on the wooden tabletop. Exciting smelling, thick, creamy pea and ham soup filled the bowls that were put down in front of us. I patiently watched the stream steam rising in nu as Nula brought in her own soup. She placed a big bowl of crusty bread rolls in the middle of the table and then sat down. Well, she said, dig in before it gets cold. Ned, be careful before you stick your tongue into that soup. Make sure it's cooled down enough. Now, whatever do you have there in that package? Nula looked down at the parcel lying there invitingly. You may well ask, Jeff replied. It was given to us by a man in the park reading a newspaper. He said that Ned and I knew a lot about those chocolate robberies that have been happening all over the country. He wanted us to find out more. How very strange, Nula remarked. Did he say who he was? 
He said he was from MI5, I answered, though unable to take my eyes from the soup, trying to make it cool down with my willpower. He said that the package contained things that we might find useful. MI5, Nulo exclaimed. They are the spies that deal with secret security things. They work from that big building that you can see next to the River Thames. Or is that MI6? I can never tell the difference. You'd better open it then. Jeff plonked the package in the space next to the bowl of crusty bread and began to tear open the brown paper wrapper. Oh wow, he said. You guys are not going to believe this. He had seen a glimpse of the contents from the piece that had been torn open. Now he fully tore the package and its secret spilled out onto the table. The first thing I noticed was banknotes. There were lots of banknotes, hundreds of pounds of many different denominations and from different countries. They were all held together with an elastic band and tucked under the band on top of the pile with a plastic credit card. It was a black Amex card with a handwritten sticky note on it that said, this card has no spending limit. Don't go mad with it. Secondly, I noticed four little maroon coloured books. They had the British coat of arms on the cover. They were passports. But why four, I wondered. The third thing I noticed was a smartphone. It suddenly began to vibrate and ring. Quick, one of you answer it, I exclaimed. Jeff made a grab for it and saw that it was a video call. He turned around a bit in the seat and held the phone up so that we could all see it. At first on the screen, it looked like a newspaper. Then the picture pulled back to reveal the man who was on the bench. This time, though, he sat in a plain white room, but he still held the newspaper in front of him. Only his legs, black gloved hands and the top of his hat were visible. Hello again, he said. Oh, time for tea, eh? Ter terribly sorry, won't take long. This phone indicated to me that you had opened the package and it was time to call you. It has a tracking device inside it. Let me further explain. The money is for you to use to fund your operation. You've been tasked to find out more about the gangs of dogs stealing chocolate and this Gabba character. You will need money to travel, for taxis, for petrol, for train fares, and we suspect for aeroplane fares. Then you will also need to pay for hotels and also perhaps for other things. He paused and we all considered what these other things might be. I took this opportunity to ask, but why are there four passports? Is someone else coming? No, he replied. It's just you two, Ned. Have you looked inside them yet? Go on, have a look now. Newlis scooped up the passports and looked inside at the pages that showed our photographs and all of our identification details. But, she stammered, I don't understand. These two are obviously Ned's and my brother's. She put two of the passports to one side. But, but these two, look carefully at the photographs, read the names and look again at the things that are on the package. Well, this one is a human, so I guess this, guess this is to do with you, she said to Jeff. Except in the picture is a person that looks a bit like you, but they have a clean-shaven chin, no beard, no glasses, and they have a large moustache. And the name is someone else's. It's John Smith. Yes, and the other one, the dog, the man behind the newspaper said. OK, said Nula. This one looks a bit like you, Ned, except the dog is a golden retriever sort of colour and also has a large moustache. This dog is called Ned Mondo. Now, that's just silly. Nula put down the passport, folded her arms, and pulled an incredulous face at the man behind the newspaper. Not at all, he said. If you're going to have convincing disguises, then you must not stray too far from the truth. You will also find in the package two false moustaches, some contact lenses to replace the glasses, and some golden retriever coloured hair dye. You two might be going to some dangerous places, and it will be necessary to change your identities. John Smith, though, groaned Jeff. You might be surprised how many people there are in the French Foreign Legion who have changed their identities to John Smith. It's very popular amongst English people. Now, you can always contact me through this phone. It is a secure line. As I am your handler, it is to me only that you report. Don't be fooled into telling anyone else anything, except the cat, Gizmo. She is very clever and will be able to help you. She'll do a lot of research for you. Jolly good, that's everything. Goodbye and good luck. With that, the phone went dead, and once again we all sat and looked at each other. Well... You had better all eat your soup before it's completely ruined, Nula said rather grumpily. Ned Mondo and John indeed. And that is where we will leave part three of Ned and the Chocolate Cheats by Mark Jarvis. I will be back soon with part four of this fantastic story and lots more videos coming your way, lots of other stories. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. I'll be back soon, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.